Hi, I'm Brad, and I'd like to welcome you to my YouTube channel. Forty years ago, on May 18th, Mount St. Helens, the only active volcano in North America, erupted. At that time, I lived in Vancouver, Washington, and I watched the eruption from my front yard just 45 miles from the mountain. These pictures were taken during that eruption and five subsequent eruptions between May and October of 1980. On May 18, 1980, I recorded live over-the-air television news broadcasts of the eruption using a $795 Curtis Mathis VHS video recorder. VCRs at that time were so new that video rental stores in the Portland, Vancouver area did not even exist. In 2005, I converted my Mount St. Helens video to a digital format. Sit back and watch firsthand eyewitness news accounts from survivors, observers, and first responders to this amazing historical event. Enjoy. This is KATU Channel 2 News for Sunday, May 18th. Reported by Bill Boaz with sports, Fred Jenkins with weather, Robin Anderson, and Stan Wilson. Good evening once again, everyone. Eight people are now known dead this evening following the massive eruption of Mount St. Helens early today. That eruption has radically changed the look of the peak, destroying a large portion of it. Geologists say this is by far the strongest eruption in the latest series, and it continues tonight. Channel 2's Essex Porter has the story. Geologists recorded the time as 8.32 this morning. Gas pressure building inside the mountain finally reached the bursting point. They think first there was an earthquake, registering five on the Richter scale. Then a split second later, the mountain started tearing itself apart. Four service planes have been flying as close as they dare to the mountain all day. But no one has seen portions of the north and northeast face. Tonight, officials say it's simply disintegrated. The area of what we had called the bulge for the last several weeks is the area that now is the opposite. It's a bowl-shaped depression. It's essentially an extension of the crater. The summit crater is much enlarged. The, the top of the mountain is not there because the crater now incorporates the area that was formerly part of the top of the mountain. And this crater now opens onto the north side. Essentially, it's breached to a very low level on the north side uh, to make a sort of open bowl-shaped depression, which is open to the bottom. And many pyroclastic flows have gone down into that bowl and swept out across the north side of Mount St. Helens and at least two and probably across Spirit Lake. The last flight that was up uh, had a chance to take a look at the north and uh, west side out away from the mountain. And I'm going to turn around here and point to the map a little bit. But this area right up here, out in this direction, for about 15 miles, all of the timber was probably blowing down in that area in a long narrow swath they were able to notice that they said they have practically no vegetation at all on the north side up to the mount margaret area and that's uh, what they're talking about they said there wasn't even as much as a stump there that all of the the trees were over on their sides at the high point on the mountain now is it in the southwest corner is at about 8400 feet in elevation Along with the explosion, a pyroclastic blast swept down the northeast flank. Composed of poisonous hydrogen sulfide gas heated to 800 degrees, the shock wave leveled an area 15 miles long and several miles wide. These pictures were shot on the south side of the mountain. Thick black ash and fumes made travel to the north too dangerous. At one time, the plume of ash rose to 50,000 feet before being carried off to the east by the wind. On the ground, forest fires were set off by the hot gases. The ash is slowing their spread, and a Forest Service firefighting team will survey the situation tomorrow. No lava has been seen yet, but blocks of pumice several feet in diameter have been thrown from the crater. Everything is happening so fast that officials say they simply don't have answers for many of the questions, but they do know the major eruption they expected has come. And that eruption continues tonight, 15 hours after it began. Essex Porter reporting. Channel 2 News. Now, just before airtime, geologists confirm there is now a second volcanic vent on the mountain. It's located four miles west of Spirit Lake by the Toodle River. Already four devastating walls of water have roared down through the Toodle River Valley, the fourth coming late this afternoon, perhaps the most damaging of all. The Toodle River swelled to three and four times its normal size. If you look closely, you can see the wall of water more than 10 feet high. 
whole trees were uprooted, floating like toothpicks down the raging river. At one point, hundreds of logs encircled a house already severely damaged by the mud and water. In other places, some houses were completely destroyed as the river washed out everything in its path. The people who hadn't been evacuated tried to escape today on foot. We don't know for sure how many of those people didn't make it. The Air Force 304th Rescue Squadron evacuated as many people as possible using the Tootle High School as a landing base. If there were doubts about the deadly power of the river, there are no more. A freight train met the same fate as everything else in the path of the river. Buses were brought in to help in the evacuation. This destruction you're seeing is from the fourth wave to sweep the valley. Right now, no one knows if there will be new waves or how deadly they would be. Robin? Stan, it's so dangerous tonight, so confusing on Mount St. Helens that even experts aren't clear what has happened. But what is clear is that miles of forest land has been flattened. Forest land many people were calling home. And for the few people air rescuers have brought out, it's a frightening tale of survival in a nightmare. Bill Van Amberg reports. It started in Tootle, but when threats from the rising river got too bad, the massive air rescue efforts moved to Kelso. All day and into the evening, searching through almost impossible situations to find almost impossible survivors. People who had made it through dust, ash, and devastated forests, struggling to survive in a wilderness gone hellishly mad. These two young campers and their dog had been staying along the Green River, more than 15 miles from the mountain, when suddenly the forest was flattened. Yeah, it was real bad. What was it like? I mean, how long were you in there? Well, too long. Yeah. It, uh, it took two of our best friends' lives. So. Did it really? yeah. There had been six in their party. Two others were injured but got out. These people had had to hike well over 14 miles, as did this man, whose family was worried he was dead. They brought out, uh, I think there were two boys and uh, a couple... One had burned hands up to about here. Uh, <coughs> Mike, I'll tie it down. Why don't you take a minute and introduce him to Cole, and maybe Cole can tell him to describe what he took down. Okay, okay, yeah. his family. I'll walk in there and I'll hey, go ahead and log it up. He had driven his truck until it just plain quit. He couldn't shake any more ash out of the air cleaner, walking in a dusty gray rain until choppered out. Fortunately, his family is safe as well. Unfortunately, it's a hit and miss situation for rescuers. You had to have an aircraft with you to get ours in and out because of the dust conditions when you're going in. You go inadvertent IFR down to a road and you just have to make an approach right to the ground. And uh, you're covered with dust by the time you get down. It's devastating. It looks like a, a hydrogen bomb or some atomic type of explosion. Everything is just level. There's nothing uh, upright. All the trees are down. Um, it's just solid white ash everywhere. At daybreak, the choppers hit the air again, hoping to find more survivors. But as the people who have made it out tell what it was like, it's clear that staying hopeful is the only way to cope with what is almost a hopeless situation. And it's unfortunate that the toll in lives seems almost certain to rise. From Kelso Airport, I'm Bill Van Amberg for Channel 2 News. If the eruption of Mount St. Helens is awesome, its effects are devastating. The volcano has triggered wave upon wave of flash floods on the Toodle River, eventually taking eight lives. We have two reports, the first from Paul Majors on the latest flooding. Shortly after 5 p.m., the third wall of water came crashing down the Toodle River, carrying logs, chunks of ice from the Shoestring Glacier on Mount St. Helens and other debris. In some areas, the Toodle has been reported at 20 feet above its banks, wiping out anything in its path. The trees that have withstood other natural disasters buckled and snapped in the wake of the water that carved new channels wherever it pleased. Then early this evening, the fourth flash flood came roaring down the river, its speed estimated at 40 miles per hour. One home in the area was in the path of the roaring waters, and like everything else, it was no match for the surging river. Carried downstream like a small dollhouse, it too became another victim of the tootle. A tool shed floating down the river had better luck, managing to stay in one piece. Four miles east of the town of Tootle, Camp Baker, a warehouser logging operation once on the banks of the tootle, now a part of the river. Equipment overturned, buildings destroyed, five people lost their lives here when the river came charging through. Early this morning, the first wave came crashing down the once quiet Tootle. Tim Storrs and photographer Jeff Olson were there. Here's a report. 
Down the Tootle River, the waters of the first flash flood roared, just on the heels of the initial explosion of the mountain at 8.40 this morning. The Weather Service had issued a flood warning, and it came none too soon. As a 20-foot wall of brown water barreled down the canyon, it smashed into the warehouser company's Camp Baker. It was this initial wave pushing tons of mud into the camp that buried it. It covered the road through the camp, covered the rail line, smashing the railroad bridge downriver from the camp and washing it away. As a lumber and slash from the camp washed away, it piled up against bridge columns and crooks in the river, further downstream damaging the main north-south rail line across the river. It was the initial floods that killed. But it was not just the water that destroyed. An Air Force Reserve captain from Portland's 304th Air Rescue Squadron, Robert Weed, says at least two of the dead found here were killed by heat, fried as he describes it. The two apparently trapped by a pyroclastic flow, a high temperature river of ash and gas. Continuing, Weed says, trees and all the vegetation was laid out flat, singed, burned, steaming, and sizzling. He reports animals standing around in apparent shock, covered with ash. It is estimated by aerial observers that the initial flash floods on this river expanded it to two to three times its normal width, and there is no sign that as the eruption continues, the floods will cease. Tim Storch reporting for Channel 2 News. The fallout is so thick, Yakima has been shrouded in darkness all day. We have this report from Ken Crockett. The National Weather Bureau office in Yakima has been closely monitoring the situation since the eruption occurred early this morning. Tons of ash have been spewing into the atmosphere, and the Yakima Valley has been one of the hardest hit in the state. And meteorologist Bud Graves says the volcano is having a strong impact on our weather. Probably the most significant thing is that as the air has uh, gone, or as the mountain has erupted, it's just upset the atmosphere that uh, mass of material and everything has just been shot straight up into the atmosphere and it's kind of just rippling off and it, uh, the atmosphere is going up and down or the air is being lifted up and down and this sets off a thunder shower or a thunderstorm. Uh, I don't know if there's rain with it. It's, it's awfully hard to tell because we've got so much ash. Those winds that keep blowing the ash into the area are expected to continue in the same direction and Graves says there's little let up expected. All of the uh, upper winds are coming right from a west to southwesterly direction, and that's just right upstream. We're right upstream from it. We are apparently on the south center part of the plume. Uh, the Dalles does not have any. Their visibility was 30 miles. Uh, it has spread to Wenatchee. Now they're down as bad as we are. Moses Lake and Ephrata are as bad as we are. Tri-Cities has not had it quite as bad. They were down to two miles feet high and behind it water is filling up to the halfway mark. Geologists say that has been verified by radar imagery. And that if the water indeed should rise to that height behind this dam, uh, the worst possible thing that could happen would be that it would rise to that level, overflow that dam, and then rapidly cut down through it and release all of that excess water at one time. Could this essentially produce worse flooding down the Tootle Valley than we've already seen? Yes, it could, indeed. But Christensen says that's not to say it will happen. There on the north side of the mountain near the base, as you can see, near Spirit Lake, more steam, a small plume. Geologist Marvin Beeson tells us it's possibly a new volcano, perhaps a crack where molten rock has been escaping, or a plume caused by steam escaping the hot ash flows. Apparently, St. Helens does not give up easily. And because of the eruption, millions of fish are dead in the Tootle and Cowlitz rivers. One salmon hatchery was destroyed and prime spawning grounds have apparently been swept away. Giant logs and mud from Mount St. Helens have filled the rivers. The fish died when their gills were clogged with mud or by hot water ranging from 80 to 100 degrees in the Tootle River. The floods forced the evacuation of five salmon hatcheries. One of those on the Green River was buried under three feet of mud. 11 million baby coho and Chinook salmon died. The log jam is reported to be 20 miles long and 600 feet wide. Clatsop County Sheriff Card Bondetti flew over it, and he says it appears to be breaking up, and some logs are uh, washing onto islands on the Columbia River. Ships wanting to get up the river are sitting right now in Astoria, waiting for that whole log jam to pass. County offices are closed, businesses are closed, except for a vital few. Roads to the west, north, and east are closed. Cars are stalled, their air cleaners choked by ashes. Motels are full of stranded travelers. Some are staying in school gymnasiums opened by the Red Cross. Mainly, it's an inconvenience. It's supposed to rain tomorrow. 
Street crews want to get some of the three inches of ash cleaned up before it clogs storm sewers like wet concrete. Rain also is expected to short out transformers, causing major power outages. But the worst effect of the fallout may well be a multi-million dollar crop loss. Ash has fallen everywhere, lying yeah. several inches deep in many places. Schools, businesses, and major arterials are closed. Police and fire officials are answering emergency calls only. Spokane's Mayor Ron Baer has declared the county to be in a state of emergency. Few people are venturing outside. Those that do are advised to take precautions to protect their eyes and nose. If there were any doubts about the dangers involved for reporters covering the volcano, there certainly aren't any anymore. Dave Crockett from our sister station KOMO-TV in Seattle had camped overnight near Mount St. Helens and was only a few miles from the volcano when it exploded. Watch and listen very closely to the voice of reporter Dave Crockett as he thought he was trapped by the deadly eruption. Dear God, whoever finds this, I don't know, I oh, can't see this, I'm sure it's, it's too dark. I've left the car behind, rest of the gear, we got one magazine, and as you can tell probably from this picture, I'm walking towards the only light I can see on top of a ridge. I can hear the mountain behind me rumbling. It's an enormous mud and water so I came down and washed out the road. I never really thought I'd believe this or, or say this, but at this moment, I honest to God believe I'm dead. There's really no, no way to describe those feelings. I feel the ash now in my eyes. It's getting very hard to breathe burnt to breathe, I'm having talking, it burns to breathe, it burns my eyes. <laughs> oh dear God, my God, this is hell. I just can't describe it, it's pitch black, just pitch black, this is, this is hell on earth I'm walking through. Oh God. I began to think I was going to make it when I hit about a thousand feet. And when I got about a thousand feet up out of the valley, a breeze came up and started to push some of the some of the sulfur, some of the smoke away from me. A little while later, a uh, helicopter, a Coast Guard helicopter, showed up and did get me out of there with a uh, with a bucket, which was quite an experience. We had a little problem with that. They got me up into the uh, helicopter and immediately put oxygen on me. Um, and got me to a hospital as quickly as possible in Kelso. The heat from the volcano in the infrared picture, we see that by Sunday midday, already into the extreme eastern portions of Oregon, and then on down to northern portions of Idaho, and eventually into western Montana. And then as we come along to this morning, we find much of the heat uh, gone. We have just a spot left right there at the volcano, so much less activity than we had yesterday, and that was still drifting off almost to the due east. Governor Ray, right after that uh, trip over the area, landed back at the Longview Kelso Airport and talked to us about the area. She stopped short of declaring it a state disaster area, but she did say the White House has been informed and is ready to expedite any aid request. As we moved, uh, turned to go from the Spirit Lake area down the, uh, the North Fork, uh, it was truly an area of, um, such as all of us have seen, the pictures of or of the moonscapes or ima imaginary scenes of other planets. Uh, the same kind of uh, eerie uh, undulating landscape with evidence of an enormous amount of, um, of um, uh, ice and, and rocks that have been blown into the area. So to see the impacts from them, 
Uh, we saw the area where there were quite a few uh, vents, a few of them with uh, steam coming up. Saw one area where there are quite a few logs lying there, some of them burning, and a great deal of steam rising uh, from the uh, literally uh, dozens of miles of uh, what had been last week standing forests uh, leveled, uh, seeing nothing now but the trunks of the trees, the foliage all uh, down underneath and all covered with layers of ash. In some places, the, uh, you think you're uh, in another world until you see the, 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 the ash uh, outlining parts of roads. We saw no victims or no survivors. We saw a large number of, um, of abandoned cars uh, farther down the valley. We uh, took a look and did The governor the says she has asked President there. Carter to declare the Toodle River Valley a disaster area. That would qualify it for federal funds. Governor Ray says she is particularly worried about the 200-foot-high wall of mud near Sp Spirit Lake. She says if that wall breaks, it may be necessary to evacuate the entire lowland area in Longview and Kelso. But we should point out that right now that's purely speculation. We don't know what that wall of mud is going to do, Kim. As, as I mentioned, that whole lowland area, not the entire city, but the lowland area could possibly be threatened, but, but nobody knows right now they should know more by this evening after they studied the film from earlier this afternoon we weren't able to see it it's entirely obscured by smoke mm -hmm. and by haze and by uh, gas and fumes of various types from the activity which is taking place so um, this is a critical thing to assess in order to figure out what's going to happen in terms of uh, possible mud flows or floods Damage in what is being called the blast area to the north of the mountain is complete. There is no evidence of anything living here, and concern is that a wall of water building near Spirit Lake will come loose. But there should be adequate time to notify anyone in the path of a flood, downriver in Tootle and Kelso. Surrounded, of course, as he always is, by Secret Service agents with a mob of press reporters. There's Governor uh, Ray. Right behind us, yeah. yeah. All right, apparently the uh, president is right behind Governor Ray. So it should be just a moment here, and uh, hopefully well, we'll see if we can get closer here. We also want to be sure that the governors and mayors know that they can contact me directly anytime they choose. This is a tremendous uh, tribute, not only to the careful monitoring and planning that went ahead of time, and the coordination of a lot of different responsible people, but the absence of uh, fear and panic and the courageous uh, response to one of the most devastating natural uh, explosions and phenomena that our country has ever seen on the part of the people who live here. And I'm very grateful for this uh, show of courage and also a calmness that has minimized uh, both human uh, suffering and also damage in the future. We hope that the uh, people will not be excessively concerned about the uh, aspects of the, of the uh, uh, catastrophe for the future. The ash is not uh, poisonous. It will not poison the land. We hope that the crops will survive uh, adequately, for instance. And uh, the general belief is that Spirit Lake, which has been dammed up by the flowing ash, is not likely to erupt into a massive and destructive uh, Blood. Did they reassure you that it's so? Yes, I think their opinion has changed on that lately because they now think that the water is oozing through that 12 miles of dam and that the, uh, and the outflow of water will be uh, very slow and steady instead of having a massive wall of water move down the valley. So we'll be working very closely with everyone concerned. I'll be taking a personal look tomorrow at the, uh, at the damage, if the weather permits. And after I come back from my tour, I'll meet again with the press. May 18th. The mountain awoke with a roar. The greatly weakened and rapidly expanding north flank of the volcano blew out in a shattering explosion heard as far away as Vancouver, British Columbia, some 200 miles to the north. I was in bed this morning. I heard some, some rumbling. I got outside, stark naked and everything. I looked up there, and I thought, it, I, thought I was going to see 25 on the Richter scale. I was scared. I was nervous. I, all I could see was I live up there pretty close to the mountain. All I could see was the whole sky was just billowing and just puffing out with smoke, and it had me nervous. I ain't kidding you. The explosion blasted nearly 2,000 feet off the mountain's elevation and about a cubic mile of earth straight into the air. The path of this hot rock, a molten avalanche itself, 
is going to knock down everything in its path and bury it. It's probably a frothy mass picking up trees, boulders, rocks, ash, dust, everything in its path flowing down the valleys with a great turmoil and a cloud over top of the escaping gases. I'd like to thank you for watching my video. Please subscribe to my channel and make sure to click the bell symbol in order to get notifications of new and exciting videos. Thank you. Bye-bye.